Hey fans, welcome to the Daily Rewind. My name's Tom Hannon and I'm your host. This is brought to you by ThisDayInBaseball.com and this is a very exciting day as we're going to bring you Game 1 of the 1959 World Series played by the uh, Chicago White Sox and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Now, in the night, during the 1951 World Series, uh, Game 1 was held on October 1st at Historic Comiskey Park. Uh, it hosted a crowd of over 48,000. That included uh, Hollywood stars such as Joan Crawford and Orson Welles. It was the first championship game in 40 years since the uh, famous, infamous Black Sox scandal. Uh, and it, it was um, also the first postseason game in 14 years in Chicago. And on the mound for the White Sox was early win, and he was faced by Roger Craig of the Dodgers. And the White Sox, the Go-Go Sox, would jump all over Roger Craig, scoring two in the first. Uh, Ted Kluzinski and Sherm Lala had RBI singles, and then they pounded across seven runs in the third. Uh, Nellie Fox doubled, Jim Landis single, Kluzinski hit a two-run homer, and they knocked Craig right out of the game. And it was just a rout by the White Sox, but it's still, nonetheless, just a fantastic game to listen to. Uh, the, the, this would be actually the last game the uh, Chicago White Sox would win at Comiskey Park in the World Series until 2005 when they actually won the World Series for the first time in 87 years. So uh, it was really um, it was a, a cool event, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, before you do... I just want to say uh, you can also go to uh, my website. There's links below uh, where you can actually see the box score. Uh, you can see the play-by-play, -play, uh, and you can get a lot more information about the players if you'd like. History of the players, recaps of their careers, and a recap of this more, even more information about this game, which is played October 1st, and all the events on October 1st. And if you enjoy it, I hope you uh, subscribe uh, and you share the show. That would be awesome if you did that. Um, and also, we have a link uh, if you're a fan of the uh, White Sox to the um, Chicago White Sox uh, Comiskey Park Stadium shirts. Uh, brings back some great memories to uh, to have, and we also have a link to the uh, Dodgers for uh, Dodger Stadium, so you can check those out as well. So, uh, without further ado, uh, here's the game. Enjoy. Cavalcade of Sports is on the air. <laughs> Comiskey Park in Chicago. They're two first today. This is the first time a West Coast team has appeared in the series, and the first time in Gillette's 21 years of broadcasting this great classic that we're coming to you from Comiskey Park in Chicago. Gillette broadcasts and telecasts major attractions on the cavalcade of sports the year round. Events that include the World Series, World's Invitational Match Game Bowling Championships, Blue Grave Football Game. Rose Bowl game, Kentucky Derby, All-Star Baseball game, and the feature fight of the week every Friday night. This is our way of thanking you for using Gillette products. This broadcast is authorized under broadcasting rights granted by the Commissioner of Baseball solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. And any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express consent of the Commissioner is prohibited. It's been a long time in Chicago at Comiskey Park. Forty years, a long wait, and White Sox fans 
are just as excited as they could possibly be over the dramatic pennant victory of Al Lopez men. And what could be more dramatic than the Los Angeles Dodgers? Coming from seventh place last year, going into a playoff, winning it in two straight, and suddenly here we are, opening up the World Series a day later than scheduled because of the playoffs, and under perfect weather, 64 degrees, with a wind coming from the northwest at eight miles per hour. This is known generally as a pitcher's ballpark because, as a rule, the wind blows in. And today, it is doing just that. Once in a while, the wind will shift, but it is blowing in today. And speaking of the pitchers, as advertised, the great early win for the Chicago White Sox and the young man who finished sensationally after coming back to the Dodgers from the minors, Roger Craig. The Dodgers did not even work out here yesterday. They were tired. Manager Wall Austin said, get some rest, boys. And so they saw Comiskey Park today for the first time as they came out to take their practice. The umpires are coming out. And we're going to give you the lineups for the opening game of the World Series. For the Los Angeles Dodgers, Jim Gilliam leading off, third base. Charlie Neal. Second base, Wally Moon, left field, Duke Snyder, center field, Norm Locker, right field, Gil Hodges, first base, Johnny Roseboro, catching, Maury Wills, shortstop, and Roger Craig, pitching. For the Chicago White Sox, Louis Aparicio, shortstop. Nellie Fox, second base. Jim Landis, center field. Ted Pluszewski, a late season arrival in the White Sox batting order as they acquired his contract from the Pittsburgh Pirates, first base. Sherm Lawler, catching. Billy Goodman, third base. Al Smith, left field. Jim Rivera, right field, early win, pitching. The 1959 World Series is being brought to you from Comiskey Park in Chicago. May I help you? Yes. I want something to relieve my child's cough. My family takes Thorexin, the guided cough medicine. Guided? What do you mean? Well, Thorexin is guided right to the spot where coughing is controlled the cough control center. You see, doctors know coughing is not controlled in the throat. Your throat merely follows orders from the cough control center, which sends the message, and you cough. <coughs> now, ordinary cough syrups don't even touch the cough center. Until now, only cough medicines with narcotics could depress this cough center. But narcotics may leave undesirable side effects. Instead of narcotics, Thorexin contains demethorphin. Thorexin soothes your throat, then speeds through your bloodstream directly to the cough control center. Thorexin relieves coughing like aspirin relieves headaches. Fast, sure, safe for the whole family. So try Thorexin, the guided cough medicine. The Los Angeles Dodgers came into this World Series with a sensational finish and beating the Milwaukee Braves and the defending champions in the National League in the playoff. And it was the third playoff for a Dodger ball club and the third in National League history. The Dodgers in 1946 lost to the Cardinals. And in 1954, they lost to the Giants. But this time, they won the playoff. Manager Walt Alston, who twice before has led the Dodgers into World Series competition, did a magnificent job in bringing his team from seventh place last year to first place. And that's the first time in National League history that has ever been done. The last time that happened in the American League, the New York Yankees in uh, 1925 finished seventh and jumped back to first place in 1926. And the Boston Red Sox finished seventh in 1945 and jumped to first place in 1946. This ballpark, to give you a bit of an idea of its layout, 
is standardized in the distances all around the park. From home plate down the left field line is 352 feet. 352 feet down the right field line. At a point in left center, it's 375. At a similar point in right center, 375. Straight away center are the two bullpens divided and a little fence about four or five feet high, and it's 415 feet away. It's a double-decked affair. It is a pitcher's ballpark as a rule. Plenty of running room for the outfielders to go get those drives. We will have different dimensions, of course, when we go to the Los Angeles Coliseum. There is a fence 12 feet high. The double-decked uh, stands will run, of course, somewhere in the neighborhood of, oh, 75 or 80 feet high uh, at, to the top of the pavilion. To get to the starting pitchers, Roger Craig, for the visitors, won 11 and lost 5. He's had quite a comeback year, just as has early win. Last year, Roger Craig, after having been demoted by the Dodgers because of a sore arm, lost 17 games in the American Association with the St. Paul, and the six foot four North Carolinian from Durham, bothered by arm trouble, plagued him last spring. The Dodgers farmed him out to Spokane, brought him up in mid-June, and he went on to win 11, and he lost five. And he did a tremendous job, ended the 1959 season with a five-game winning streak. Pitched complete games in his last three starts. He has pitched in three World Series games, two of them starts, starting the fifth game of the 55 series against the Yankees at Ebbets Field, winning 5-3, to three, giving up two runs, four hits, and six innings. And in 1956, he started the third game at Yankee Stadium, lost it 5-3. He was used in relief in the seventh game of the 56 series at Ebbets Field. His overall series record, 12 innings, 14 hits, 10 runs. All of them are in eight walks and eight strikeouts. Early win is one of the all-time winning pitchers. At 39 years of age, he won 22 games. He lost 10. He pitched in only one World Series against the Giants at the Polo Grounds and lost it. He has won 271 Major League games and stands 15th among the all-time winners. He led the majors in victories this year, and in his only previous series game, he started for Cleveland against the Giants in the second game in 1954, losing it 3-1, to one, giving up only four hits in seven innings. These two ball clubs sport good defense. The Dodgers figure to have a little more power. The Dodgers have depth in pitching, though as Walt Alston says, a great deal depends on control. When they have control, they can pour the ball by you. The White Sox, with early win, the Bellwether, have uh, Billy Pierce and a surprise this year in George Shaw, and they have good pitching, good relief pitching in Jerry Staley and Turk Lown. Right now, we have at home plate a color guard, and we'll have a band in the moment playing as we have our national anthem. But this series promises to be one in which you will find both teams playing close to the best baseball quite a lot. The White Sox have won an amazing number of one-run games, and so have the Dodgers. They get a man on. They sacrifice him. They have men who can steal bases. And so it's going to be an exciting series in, in that respect. And you also have catchers on both sides, Roseboro and Lawler, who can fire that ball. Louis Aparicio, who stole 56 bases this year, is a man to be watched. And a fellow like Maury Wills is one of the fastest men in the majors. And a young man who came along later in the season uh, with the Dodgers took over at shortstop and helped solidify the team. Both managers really know their baseball. Wal Alston has had previous World Series experience. Al Lopez has always been... Uh, a bridesmaid, but never quite a bride. He has never finished lower than second in Cleveland or Chicago, but this is the year for the senor. Al Lopez, one of the best-liked men in baseball. And so we're looking forward to one of the most exciting World Series. This is America's greatest sports spectacle. The umpires 
Bill Summers, the American League at home plate. And this will be his eighth appearance. He's from Upton, Massachusetts. Frank Vascoli of Danielson, Connecticut at first base of the National League. Uh, Summers from Upton, Mass. And Dan uh, Dascoli from Danielson, Connecticut. Ed Hurley from Holyoke, Massachusetts of the American League. And his third series will be at second base. And Frank Sicori of Port Huron, Michigan will be the umpire at third base. It's his second series. Johnny Rice of the American League in his first series, a native of Chicago along the left field line. And Hal Dixon will be stationed along the right field foul line. He of the National League, and he's from St. Petersburg, Florida. So the 28-year-old Roger Craig and the 39-year-old Early Wynn will be the opening game pitchers. And already, both managers have named their pitchers for tomorrow. It'll be George Shaw for the White Sox and Johnny Padres for the Dodgers. The weather today is a little bit on the cool side, but fine, 64 degrees. And, of course, they're jam-packed here. Comiskey Park's seating capacity is 46,550, but with standing room, they may move closer to 50,000. While at the Los Angeles Coliseum, they can pack in close to 100,000. But right now, we will have... And now, our national anthem, Tony Martin. WGY 810 in your dial and WGFM connect today. And so the scene is set for the first game of the 1959 World Series, the 10th World Series and the 57th World Series game for the Dodgers. This is the fourth series and the 21st Series game for the White Sox. Ten Dodger players have had previous World Series experience. Perillo, Hodges, Snyder, Gilliam, Labine, Craig, Padres, Drysdale, Neal, and Zimmer. Kopax was eligible for 55. There go the White Sox on the field. Smith, Jorgensen, Lawler, and Wynn are previous uh, series uh, men that are on the White Sox team, and they were with uh, other clubs. As the White Sox take the field, and as we get set for the first game of the World Series, it is with great pleasure that I turn the microphone over to my colleague, one of America's great sports voices. Our paths cross many times on national sports events. During the season, we broadcast the Philadelphia Phillies games. Byron Sound. Thank you very much, Mel. And right now... Red Faber 
who was on the championship team in 1917 when the White Sox last won the world's championship, makes the first throw. His old battery mate, Ray Shock, is also here. And, of course, it's great to see these old timers. As Mel mentioned, the White Sox are already on the field. You couldn't ask for a better baseball day. And now the Dodgers are getting ready to go to bat. Now, this World Series, as you know, has to go four games, and it can go as long as seven. Matter of fact, over the last three years, the series has carried to the full seven games. 39-year-old right-hander Early Wynn is now warming up. His only World Series performance in 1954, he was defeated, and the fellow that actually knocked him out of the game was the fabulous Dusty Rowe. Now, the Dodgers have come into the World Series after winning two over the Milwaukee Braves. It's been a fantastic Cinderella team that comes here from Los Angeles. And as Mal mentioned earlier, they were so tired after their plane trip back to Chicago that they did not work out here yesterday. So we're ready to go. The World Series of 1959. And here to lead off, Jim Gilliam, third baseman, a switch hitter. And over the season in the National League was batting at 282. Now wins almost everything at his control. He's a fierce competitor. He's fast. He throws slow, tantalizing curveball. He throws a screwball. Here comes the first pitch of the ball game. Gilliam takes it down the pipe to strike one. Gilliam will be followed by Charlie Neal and Wally Moore. Roseboro, later on, of course, coming up batting seven. Craig against Win today. Inside and low, one and one. Win won more games than any other pitcher in the major leagues. Quite a comeback. He won 14 a year ago, but this season, a 22 game winner. The Huskies swings into action. Trick two is called on Junior. Gilliam, of course, is the ideal leadoff man. He draws a lot of walks. He's an excellent butter. Billy Goodman, who was playing up a bit shallow, is now backed up to normal depth. Wins ahead on the count. One ball, two strikes. There's a bounding ball to shortstop. Louis Aparicio makes the first out as he hooks the ball to Ted Pazuski. And that's all for Junior Gilliam. One gone. Yes, it's been a long time since the Chicago fans have had a World Series in the Windy City. You have to go back to 1945 when the Cubs were in the World Series. And, of course, way back to 1919 when the Sox were last in the series. Here's one of the finest infielders in baseball. His name is Charlie Neal, second baseman and a right-handed batter. Goes into the series with a 287 average over the season, including the two playoff games. Swinging, strike one. Now, Charlie will be a tremendous threat back at the Coliseum. That's where the third game will be played next Sunday, for he has hit most of his 19 home runs at the Coliseum. The Sox are playing him straight away. Fastball, he cuts and fouls it off. Strike two. Now, Charlie is rated as one of the best curveball hitters in baseball. And these first two pitches offered up by Wynn have been fast ones up around the letters. On the coaching lines today for the Dodgers, the veteran Greg Malevi at first base, and Pee Wee Reese, one of the all-time greats, is coaching at third base. One out and nobody out. Wynn ahead, 0-2. Inside, a ball. It's very interesting to notice the skipper, Al Lopez, standing here at the extreme right end of the home team dugout, which is located just off to our left on the third base side. He was trying to make an adjustment on his right fielder, Jim Rivera. Outside, breaking pitch, 2-2. I would say the crowd is over 50,000 today, standing room only. All points lead to Comiskey Park today. Two balls, two strikes. Wynn into the motion. 
Outside pitch is slapped foul, and this ball is carrying over to the right side of the plate and going on to the roof. Most of the streets in Chicago have been designated as one-way avenues. Later on, when the game is over, they all lead back to the loop. Even new street signs have been added here to show people, the visitors, how to get to this famous Comiskey Park. Two balls, two strikes. Long fly ball, but it's curving foul to left. Al Smith coming over, but it disappears into the upper deck. Two balls and two strikes. In the on-deck circle is Wally Moon. Now, some of these Dodgers have never seen this ballpark. And these teams did not even meet in spring training. They had a couple of games scheduled, but they were rained out. 2-2. Two -two. Another foul. Neal stays alive. Now, your infield for the Sox, Billy Goodman operating at third, Aparicio at short, Nelly Fox at second base, Ted Kluzuski, the huge first baseman who came over on the 25th of August at first, and in the outfield, it's Al Smith, Jim Landis, Jimmy Rivera, Lawler catcher, turn to Ball three is low and outside. Neal standing fairly deep in the batting box. This fella has a real good level short swing. He taps one wide of third. Billy Goodman can't have it. The ball skids off the glove and goes back of Aparicio. And Charlie Neal is safe with a base hit. A base hit. The first to the World Series of 1959. Walt Austin will tell you Wally Moon coming to bat. This wiry Texan was the most consistent ball player he had all year. He came from the St. Louis Cardinals and he played in practically every game. Wally is a left-handed batter. Mal and I were trying to decide whether he was in left or right, but today he is starting left field. Now Wynn keeps an eye on the base runner, Charlie Neal. A token throw, he's safe. One out and one man on at the top of the first inning. The Dodgers at bat. Win throws. Strike call to get the fastball. On the season, Wally hit 302. And on the bases, he's a very, very good, daring base runner. He'll take a base when you least expect it. Now Wynn again flips over to first base. Neal still there. All right, the KG right-handed throws, and Moon sends a high fly ball to left. It's playable, and Aparicio is coasting back and getting under, and Louie puts it away for the second out. Two gone. Duke Snyder. Veteran of many World Series. Batting in the cleanup spot. Now coming in. It's amazing that Duke has been in six World Series. He's been in 32 ball games. And of course, in a couple of those series against the Yankees, he was red hot. I think another one of the reasons that Los Angeles came back so strongly from seventh to win the title was a couple of their old pros, fellas like Snyder and Hodges, Carl Carrillo. Duke's a left-hander. They play in deep to right, and strike one is called. Now, the wind at all times in Chicago is a factor, and it is blowing directly in from center field at about eight miles an hour. Neal gets a pretty good lead, and there he goes. The pitch is outside, and Charlie Neal steals second base. He got a great lead on early win that time. 
and a successful steal at second base. Well, this is one of the things that we were looking for from the Chicago White Sox. And Charlie Neal, who during the season was the second best base dealer on the Dodger ball clock, has come up with the first steal in the series. Now they've got a runner at second base. The count on the Duke. One ball, one strike. Now Lawler's throw was accurate enough, but it was a late. Here we go. Foul. But sent directly back into the screen. Well, the press box today is completely overloaded. Down in front of us, the visiting scribes from all over the country are actually sitting in some of the choice seats here that would be utilized during the regular season. And Mel and I have a wonderful position to call the game today. We're directly behind home plate, sitting up high, just under the rooftop. Two men are gone. No score. But the Dodgers have Charlie Neal at second base. who plays the hitters about as well as anyone, plays a very deep second base on Snyder. Klazuski playing deep and fairly close to the line at first. Outside, low. That ball just missed the strike zone. You can see Wynn sort of clenches fist out there and says, gee, I thought I had it. A full count on Snyder. Charlie Neal came up with an infield single and then moved into second base with a successful steal. Now something's got to give. Win on the stretch. Here's the pitch. High for ball four. Snyder walks. And the Dodgers have runners at first and second base. Well, you could see Wynn was certainly trying to work the corners, and he didn't give Snyder too much to hit at. Now, Norm Locker is hitting in the number five batting spot. Norm Locker. Locker hit 290 on the season. They've got him in right field. And there was a time when Gil Hodges was hurt, and he took over at first base. Sends one foul, a high twisting ball that's off on the third base side. Strike one. Locker has to be one of the most underrated players on the Dodger ball club. It reminds me a lot of Nellie Fox. He's had to fight his way into the major leagues. And this fellow was a consistent 300 hitter four years in a row in the minor leagues before he got a chance in the big show. Austin loves to rave about this fellow's swing. A short swing and a very level swing. He's a left-handed batter. Win cuts loose outside. One and one. This batter, Norm Locker, is considered to be the Dodgers' best bunter. And he won a few games for L.A. this year with a squeeze bunt. Strike. Good breaking pitch. The booming voice of Bill Summer, the veteran of the American League, working behind the plate today. Also, we have two added umpires today, one down the right field line and one down the left field line. This is the first game of the World Series. The Dodgers are posing a threat here in the first inning. Two on, two out. And Walker the batter. Win ahead. He throws. 
There's a well hit ball to right field. Jimmy Rivera is over the hall, waiting, and the White Sox have come out of the first inning. Los Angeles, no runs, one hit, two left. There were no errors. The score completing a half inning from Comiskey Park today. L.A. nothing, Chicago nothing. Well, the leadoff man in the bottom of the first inning will be Louis Aparicio. And what a ball player he is. Unanimously voted the top shortstop in the league. He is a leading candidate for the most valuable player award. Of course, Louis is a Gillette user and one of our top boosters. Now listen what he has to say about the new Gillette adjustable razor. Yes, there's nothing like a razor you set to your own skin and beard. Boy, what comfort I get. Now, fans, you'll agree with Louie, I'm sure, that once you try that amazing new Gillette 195 adjustable, and here's why. This sensational new razor has a dial located right on the handle. You adjust it instantly to match your particular combination of skin and beard. Now, there are nine different numbered stops. At the settings with the lower numbers, you expose less blade edge. As you dial a higher number, blade exposure and angle increase. With the adjustment that's exactly right for you, well, shaving is a breeze. Clean, quick, and with comfort that's almost unbelievable. Yes, the Gillette Adjustable with dispenser of Gillette Blue Blades and travel case costs just $1.95. Craig warming up, easygoing North Carolinian who has been the hottest Dodger pitcher over the last three weeks. Here is Louis Aparicio. He stands only 5'8", but he is the darling of the fans here in Chicago. He is batting at 257. From Maracaibo, Venezuela, a right-handed batter. Here's Craig's pitch, strike one, call. Craig at one time was a fine fastball pitcher. However, he encountered arm trouble. Today, he is principally a slider and sinker ball artist. Strike two is called. And he prides himself in getting the ball over the plate. Austin has already pointed out, to beat the White Sox, you've got to keep this little fellow off the bases. He pops one up. Near second base. And the shortstop is coming over. That's Murray Wills who makes it. One down. Nelly Fox. Nelly is the only 300 hitter in the Chicago lineup today. Batting in 306. But what a competitor he is. That's some left-handed. From St. Thomas, Pennsylvania. And I suppose that about half of that little community in western Pennsylvania is attending this World Series. Outside, low. One and all. It's Craig pitching with Roseboro catching. Your infield is Junior Gilliam, Maury Wells, Charlie Neal, and Gil Hodges. Walker, Snyder, and Moon holding down the outfield. Steps out and apparently has asked the plate umpire to look over the ball. One and all. Outside, a ball. Now, Fox is an unusual hitter. He cataloged as a spray hitter. He stands right on top of the plate and he gets many of his hits to left field. High for ball three. Well, the Dodgers had two men on in the first inning, but could not score. It's nothing to nothing in the first game of the World Series from Chicago. Strike. Jimmy Landis, another one of the speed boys of the Go-Go Sox, is on deck. Craig fires high for ball four, and the Sox now a base runner. Now 
fielder Jimmy Landis coming up. Jimmy Landis. One of the bright stars coming along. You just can't beat this fella in the outfield. And Lopez gets a lot of credit for the patience he's had with this youngster in bringing him along as a batter. Strike one, call. Over the past season, he hit 264. Jimmy Landis. And I noticed the Dodgers, and they've scouted this club very, very well. They play him to left. Here's a pitch out, a throw to first base, and there goes Fox sliding in. He's back safely. Now the Dodgers figured that Fox was going to be on his way. Swings, he tried to go to right field that time and fouls it off. One and two. Now the second game of the World Series will originate here in Chicago tomorrow. And it will be coming on the air at 1.45 Eastern Daylight Time. It has been announced that Johnny Padres and Bob Shaw will pitch tomorrow. Saturday will be a travel date. And the third game of the World Series will come from Los Angeles on Sunday. At a later time, another foul. Craig working an outside edge on this young outfielder. One ball, two strikes. Landis is 25 years old, and he hails from Richmond, California. Bill Summers has stopped the ball game and has uh, moved out to the mound. He's talking to Craig. Craig down the stretch was simply terrific. He won his last five games and of course pitched a wonderful game last Sunday against the Cubs right here in Chicago to help clinch the pennant, at least a tie for it. Outside and low. Two balls, two strikes. One gone. Fox edging off at first base. Outside and low. He just missed with his slider pick. Three balls, two strikes. Now the coaches... For well, the White Sox, Tony Cuccinello at third base, and Don Gutteridge really whipping up some enthusiasm as a coach at first base. Here we go. He swings the line drive, a base hit into right center. Fox is going to make it to third base as the ball is fielded by Locker. A single, and the White Sox fans are really cheering now. young Jim Landis, his first time up in World Series competition, comes through with a solid base hit. Well, the White Sox have runners at first and third, one out. And here's one of their late additions. And he's been quite a ball player. The mammoth Ted Klazuski, who was born and raised right here near Chicago, but today makes his home in Cincinnati. He joined the White Sox, coming over from Pittsburgh on the 25th of August. Outside of all. On the season, he hit 275. And about three years ago, it was doubtful if Ted was going to stay in baseball at all. He had a very, very severe hip and back condition. Strike. One ball, one strike. Roger Craig and a bit of hot water here in the first. Fox got a walk. And Landis had a 3-2 pitch. Lined it over Charlie Neal's head into right side. One and one. There goes the runner. The hit run is on. A base hit. Here comes Fox home. And the White Sox lead one to nothing. getting a 
a taste of how the White Sox win ball games. Nellie Fox already at third. Landis took off. And of course, just the movement of the base runner sometimes throws the infield a bit off. And there was a hole between first and second, and Klozuski poured it through there. So the mighty Ted has batted across the first run of the game. One nothing, Chicago. Although Klozuski has been in baseball for many years, this is the first time he's ever played in the World Series. He tries a punt, and he loops it foul. Strike one. We looked back through our records on World Series competition, and we found that Waller did catch back in 1947. He believes that the Chicago team of this year is the greatest he's ever played for. He's a right-hander, and of course, over the last week or so, he's been out with an injured hand. Jim Bunning of Detroit hitting. Uh, accidental pitch got away, and it was a bruise, and he was held out of competition there for a few days. But he's the real leader of this Chicago pitching staff. He operates like Dal Crandall of that Milwaukee Brave team. There's a full foul to left. Strike two. Sherm hit 22 home runs during the season, which was the highest total of all of the Chicago ball players. Chuck Churn is now starting to throw a few in the bullpen. And I might add, here in Comiskey Park, the two bullpens are located straight away in center. Uh, the Dodger bullpen to the right of the flagpole and the home team bullpen just to the left and the huge scoreboard uh, just above it. Every seat taken here for the first game of the series a terrific first inning so far. The Sox are leading outside low. One ball, two strikes. Now Craig did get into a World Series in 1955. As a matter of fact, he was a winner over the Yankees. The next year, in 1956, he was defeated by Whitey Ford in a World Series game, 5-3. Two men are on. The stretch of the pitch, and it's a slap foul. It's just off to our right. And caught by one of the visiting strides. Needless to say, there were hundreds and hundreds of writers talking with Craig before the game. He seemed to be more uh, concerned about his hitting. He says, you know, I'm not a bad hitter. He throws. Outside, low. Two balls and two strikes. Nellie Fox has already scored the first run of the 1959 World Series. He scampered home on a single by Ted Klosowski. And Craig is not out of the woods by any means. Landis is now at third. Klosuski at first. One out. Inside and high. Ball three. And they've got Craig working. It's a second 3-2 count. He's run up in the last half of the first inning. One to nothing's the score. The Chicago White Sox lead. Three balls, two strikes, a pop foul. It's carrying, I believe, out of play. Yes, coming over just beyond the photographer's ledge. One of the most terrific things about the Dodger team and its amazing stretch run has been their terrific pitching, as Mel Allen told you earlier. This club won 15 out of its last 20 games. And if they were not strong in the starting, they had some terrific youngsters to come out of that bullpen. All right, three and two to Lawler. He swings, a line drive, well hit into deep right center field. Locker way, way out. Center fielder Snyder. It's grabbed by Locker. Here's a tag, and here comes the second run across. And I want you to know that that ball was really hit into that win. Lawler is out, but it's a sacrifice fly. Landis has come across, 
and Chicago leads by a score of two to nothing. Klosuski remained at first base. That ball was really hit, and the way Locker went for it and then uh, almost gave up on it, he heard Snyder coming along, but Locker stayed with it, and it is quite a catch. An RBI for Sherm Lawler. Now your batter is Billy Goodman, a very much underrated ball player who takes strike one. Now in this series, you can look for Billy Goodman and Bubba Phillips to alternate at third. Here's a fly ball into center. Snyder backing off, has the room, and the Duke has it for the final up. Well, that was quite a first inning, wasn't it, for Chicago? Two runs, two hits, one man left off. There were no errors, and at the end of the first inning, the score, Chicago 2, L.A. nothing. Just twist that dial and you're all set with the adjustable razor by Gillette. For shape so easy, fast and clean, so try and see what we mean. We pause now, 30 seconds for station identification. Saratoga Vichy's Living Carbonation never goes flat, stays sparkling alive to give you extra dry flavor. That's why Saratoga Vichy always tastes better. Insist on Saratoga Vichy. Saratoga Vichy. Yellow label. Saratoga Vichy. Yellow label. Saratoga Vichy. WGY, WGFM Schenectady. Series time is clean sweep time on all 59 Plymouth cars and Suburbans at Schenectady Plymouth. Jim Schultz says, come and get them at clean sweep prices. 1016 State Street, Schenectady. Comiskey Park decked out in all of its glory today. And the White Sox are leading two to nothing as we enter the top half of the second inning. Gil Hodges will be leading off. The first baseman, Gil Hodges. Hodges, over the last couple of weeks of the National League pennant race, usually was batting in the number five batting spot. He's an all pro. He's been in seven World Series. And, of course, Gill has had his ups and downs. Two weeks ago, he was almost bandaged from head to foot, but he kept playing. He's a fellow that seems to get the clutch hits. The powerful-looking right-handed batter. Wynn gets this one over. Strike one call. Hodges, to be followed by Johnny Rose, Barrow, the catcher, and Mari Wills, the shortstop. Aparicio plays well over toward third base on this right-hander. Outside, a ball. Early win is working today against Roger Craig. And, of course, in a series that cannot go more than seven games. Winning that first one is a mighty big item. Outside, ball two. Now when it appears, has great stuff. He's trying to work the corners. He ran the count full in the first inning on two batters and lost each one of them. Two balls and a strike. There's a well-hit ball to left field. Smith backing up. He's near the wall. He has it. That ball was hit a good 350 feet away. And it's only 352 feet to the left field wall. To give you an idea. One down. Number 44, the left-handed hitting catcher of the Dodger ball team, John Roseborough. Number 44, the catcher. Johnny Roseborough. From Compton, California. Johnny didn't hit too high on the average, but he certainly came up with some big hits over the last week. Fouls this one out of play, strike one. Many of you remember his home run at Milwaukee on Monday, won the first game in the playoff, three to two. Good power to right. Nobody on, one out. Wind cuts loose, a change, it's high. One and one. Yeah. 
even at 39 years of age, Wynn has one of the most graceful moves and pitching motions of anyone I've ever known. Too high, ball two. Anytime the Sox were in difficulty this year, he was a man that won the key game. There was a stretch in September when the Sox lost three in a row and they were starting to worry. And he stopped that losing speak in a hurry. Two and one. A foul up and overhead. Two and two. It's nice to be talking with you. The World Series is underway. The first two games, as you know, are to be staged here in the American League Park. The next three will come from Los Angeles, the Coliseum, and if more games are needed, back here in Chicago. 2-2. Two -two. Win throws. Fly ball, infield, third base side. And Avariccio is making the call. And Louis stays with it for the end. You know, with a glove and on base, there is no equal to that little fella, Aparicio. Two gone. The score is two to nothing. The White Sox lead in the first game of the World Series. Maury Wills. Maury Wills, shortstop, is being announced. Now, Maury has certainly been an integral part of this Dodger success. He wasn't even with the Dodger ball club in spring training. He has become a switch hitter, and he certainly did a tremendous job for them in the month of September. Strike one call. He is batting left-handed. While he hit 260 on the season, he hit better than 400 in the month of September. Two are gone and nobody on. Now, spinning off on the third base side, Strike two. Wynn has given up one hit. Also a walk. And he had the right pitch to get out of the first inning. A heavy set right-hander throws high and inside. A ball. At the moment, the sun has disappeared. Temperature reading is in the mid-60s. High and outside, ball two. It's been interesting to watch Maury Wills. He formerly was a right-handed batter. And he decided to go to switching. Built along the lines of Louis Aparicio. 2-2. Two -two. Outside, ball three. He was telling many of the writers, broadcasters, and TV men today that Richie Ashburn gave him a little tip. He found that he was lifting his left leg just before swinging into the pitch. And on that tip, he went on to have a tremendous late surge. 3-2. He stuck him up. That's all for Marty Wills. A strikeout for win. No runs, no hits. Nobody left on for Los Angeles. That'll be the end of one and a half from Comiskey Park. The Dodgers nothing. Chicago, two. You know, there's almost a thousand sport writers covering the news of this game today. And now here's another piece of news. That Gillette 195 adjustable razor gives shaving comfort like you've never had before. Have you tried it yet? Believe me, fans, it's the greatest. Let me tell you about it. There are nine different adjustments on this razor. You just turn the micrometer dial to the one that matches your skin and beard exactly. You set it at a higher number, you expose more blade edge. At lower numbers, retracts the blade. Yes, it's that easy to find your setting, and then the comfort you get, well, it's all but unbelievable. See the Gillette 195 adjustable razor. Try it with dispenser.
Tracer of Gillette Blue Blades and Streamline Travel Case, it cost $1.95. Mal Allen, this is by song. We're sitting in on the first game of the World Series. The Sox lead two to nothing. Roger Craig getting ready to go, and the batter is Al Smith. Smitty was in one of the World Series. As a matter of fact, he got a home run in the first inning. He's happy to be here in Chicago. On the season, he hit 237, and Craig pitches a quick sinker inside and low. One and all. They play Al Smith as a full hitter to left. Strike, says Bill Summer. Craig throws, and uh, Smith ran up on the pitch, tried a bunt, and it is fouled off. One ball, two strikes. The White Sox made good use of a walk, two singles, and a sacrifice fly to get two runs home in the first inning. Strike three called, and that's all for Al Smith. Craig hangs up a strikeout. Right fielder, Jim Rivera. Jim originally uh, hailed from Brooklyn, but now lives here in the state of Indiana. And he will be alternated in right field, according to the pitching. All right, a foul that he beats along the first base line. Strike one. Over the season, Jimmy hit at 226. But he's a real live wire, and he keeps this Chicago ball club very loose. Left-hander with a slightly open batting stance. Sends a high, twisting foul that might be playable. Hodges coming off the line, and Gill backs up and makes it. And that is all for the Chicago outfielder. Two down. Here comes Early Wynn. Having a nice round of applause. It's going to be interesting to see... Uh, now Al Lopez will rotate his starting pitchers. But the Chicago writers have been speculating all week that this fellow is likely to be a starter in three different games if the series goes that far. Now Wynn is considered to be one of the best hitters in baseball, and he's a switch hitter. He had a 244 batting average over the season. He had 22 hits, and he also hit a couple of home runs. He is batting left-handed against Craig. Swinging. Strike one. Most of the managers I've talked with always point to early win. They were asked, what pitcher would you like to have if you had to win one ball game? Strike two. Call. I notice that Craig works a little more faster between the pitches than win. Two gone. Two nothing. Chicago leads. Taps the ball to the mound. Craig bobbles, recovers, and throws. And that's all for early win. Three up and three down of the second inning for the Go Go Sox. We have now completed two innings in World Series game number one. Score White Sox two, LA nothing. Now, with the miracle of guided medicine, you can relieve your cough as easily as you relieve a headache. Take Thorexin, the guided cough medicine that goes to the right spot, your cough control center. Doctors know coughing is not controlled in the throat. Your throat merely follows orders from the cough control center. 
which sends the message, and you cough. <coughs> now, ordinary cough syrups don't even touch the cough center. Until now, only cough medicines with narcotics could depress this cough center. But narcotics may leave undesirable side effects. Instead of narcotics, Thorexin contains demethorphan. Thorexin soothes your throat, then speeds through your bloodstream directly to the cough control center. Thorexin relieves coughing like aspirin relieves headaches. Fast, sure, safe for the whole family. So get Thorexin, the guided cough medicine. Roger Craig will be leading off in the top of the third inning. Roger Craig, a right-handed batter, leading off against Wynn. And high and inside. One and all. It's been a fantastic story on Craig. He came up from Spokane midway through the season. He had a losing record in the minor leagues. And last year at St. Paul, he lost, I believe, more games than anyone in the uh, league. But what a comeback. Here's a foul upstairs. One and one. Of course, the reasoning on that is that he had a sore arm and he was trying to work it out. He claims today that he's a lot smarter pitcher, although he doesn't throw quite as hard. One and one. Strike two is called. Lead off better, and he'll be followed by Jim Gilliam. A ball. Now, Craig has almost every bit of information on his baseball career at his fingertips. He was telling us he got one hit in the World Series. I believe that was in 1956, even though he lost the game to Whitey Ford. Swinging, he's out. That's a second strikeout in a row for early win. And here we come to the top man in the batting order, Junior Gilliam. Remember at one time, he played second base, and for a while... When the Dodgers had a championship team a few years back, he was in left field. There's a pop-up. It is playable, and Ellie Fox is backing off. Fox is under, and has it. Two gone. L.A. sends up. Second baseman, Charlie Neal. He came along with an infield single in the first inning. The ball skidded away from Billy Goodman at third base. Then he proceeded to steal second base. But he didn't get any further. When working like a machine now, throws low and away. Ball one. and takes inside high, ball three. Strike. Right-hander early win today lives in a little community known as Nokomis, Florida. It's on the West Coast. He's one of the most popular ball players I think I've ever known, and one of the most intelligent. A foul. Three and two. He is a sports writer at different times during the year. He flies his own personal plane. 
But he says, I've never won a World Series game, and I'm really after this one. Three two as he works on Charlie Neal. Long drive to left. Way, way back goes Al Smith. This ball is foul. It is foul. It went into the seats, but it's foul. And that's one of the reasons we have the extra umpire along the lines. That's John Rice of the American League, who was in a tremendously good spot to call it. Neal just missed a home run, and he didn't miss it by very many feet, believe me. Just a long strike, and the count is three balls, two strikes. Now he had to wait until the last moment on that one, but it curled out foul. And another foul ball. Lawler discarding the mass, coming back. Will he have room? No. And the batter Neal stays alive. Now this is one of the toughest parks in baseball for home run hitting. As Mal mentioned earlier, it's 352 feet down each line, and it's 415 feet straight away to center. Early delivers. There's a top ball, a wide of third, but here's little Aparicio, and Louis gets his man. A great play by Aparicio. And it's the final out here in the third inning. No runs for L.A. No hits. Nobody left. We go to the last half of the third inning. It's still Chicago, two, and Los Angeles, nothing. Well, Casey Stingle is certainly as good as his word. He said he'd be at today's game, even if he had to pay to get in. And believe me, he's here. You know, old Case is never at a loss for words. And he sure had some nice ones to say about that remarkable new Gillette 195 adjustable razor. And here they are. No razor I ever had even comes close to that new Gillette adjustable of yours. Believe me, you get clean, comfortable shaves that are tops. Yes, that's the story. Never before has there been a razor like the Gillette adjustable. You simply turn the adjusting dial to get nine different degrees of edge exposure and edge angle. One fits your exact requirements. You find your setting at a jiffy. A turn to the left gives less exposure. Dial to the right for more blade edge. The Gillette 195 adjustable is a one-piece razor. Changes blades instantly. Wrenches clean fast. And it's sold with this guarantee. You get the finest shave that you've ever had or your money back. In trim travel case with Gillette Blue Blades dispenser, the Gillette adjustable costs only $1.95. And here we go. The leadoff man is Aparicio. He sends one into right. Waiting for it is Locker. And that is all for Aparicio. Goes for the first pitch. Yes, it's World Series time. And all roads in the Midwest are leading the Comiskey Park in the south side of Chicago. Aparicio has gone out twice now. And this is Nellie Fox. Foxy drew a walk in the first inning and scored the first run of the game. Strike one, call. A ball. Fox chokes way up on the bat. He seldom will beat you with a home run, but he can beat you so many other ways. There's a line drive, hit the right field. Down into the right field corner goes Locker. Fox is going to dig for two. Here comes the throw. It's a double for L.A. Fox. Well, the first extra hit, extra base hit of the ball game. Fox at second base, one gone. Jim Landis coming along to bat. You know, that kind of fooled us, too, in the 
broadcasting booth because Foxy most of the time goes to left and left center for his hits. This is Jim Landis. He singled in the first inning. There's the ball to uh, right field, a base hit. Fox is heading for the plate, and he's going to score without a throw. Norm Locker takes the second. Three to nothing, Chicago. that Jimmy Landis. He has a big two for two in the first game of the World Series. And an RBI. That ball was hit just over the head of Charlie Neal, who leaped high, but he couldn't get to the ball. Now, once again, in that Dodger bullpen, Churn starts tuning up. Four hitter is Ted Klususki. Theodore came up with a hit. He put a hit run on with Landis in the first inning. And he drove in the first run of the game. A move to first. Look out. Landis just got back. He went in head first. You can hear the go-go fans hollering, go, 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 Landis. Another move to first. Landis safe. Kurt, you've heard so much about Louis Aparicio and his base stealing. Landis might have been overlooked, but not by the Dodgers. Now, with so much attention directed at first base, Kozuski backs out. Inside Law, the pitch. One and all. Time is out. Here's Neal. Coming in from second base. The score again is three to nothing. The White Sox have come up with four hits. You know, just a few years ago, a Clue was capable of getting 35 to 40 home runs a season. Uh, but lately, he's been more of a line drive hitter. Another move to first and almost a wide throw by Craig. Good stop by Hodges. Only one out. One run in. Blue hits a long fly to right. Way up in the air, but it might be playable. Locker back, back. It is into the seat. It goes in for a home run. watched it go in to the second or third row. You know, after coming over to the American League earlier, Clue only hit two home runs, to my knowledge, and they came in the same game. But, man, he really showed us power here. How about that, Mel? He sure did. Clue has helped this club uh, a great deal. They've had a lot of uh, problems at first base. Earl Torgerson, who played in the World Series in 48 for the White Sox, uh, came over, but did not hit consistently enough. The White Sox have been trying out several first basemen. They needed a long ball hitter to go with Lawler, and they got big clue. And, of course, while, as you said, he doesn't hit the home run as often as he used to, he's still dangerous, and he just proved it. Right, you are now. Now, in a moment, we'll have a new pitcher coming on, and Chuck Turn, we told you, has been warming up. Right now, we pause 30 seconds for station identification. WGY, WGFM Schenectady. Enjoy a perfect mixed drink every time with Saratoga Vichy. No other mixer can equal the extra dry flavor of the long-lasting sparkle of the Vichy with the yellow label. Saratoga Vichy. 
Sacrifice a little time to save. Save money at Troy Savings Bank, where deposits made before October 15th earn a big three and a quarter percent from October 1st. Well, Roger Craig leaves. Manager Austin has made the first pitching change. And Chuck Churn, C-H-U-R-N, right-hander, comes on to pitch. Hail from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, 6'3", a 205-pounder. Now, here's a story on turn. Number 45, Chuck Kern. Chuck Chuck was in 14 games for the Dodgers during the 59 season. He was one of their late arrivals. However, he did win three games. He lost two. And had an earn on average of 4.94. So Craig has been knocked out after two and a third innings. And what salvos? A double by Fox, a single by Landis, and a home run by Ted Glazuski. After two and a third innings, Craig is out. He gave up five runs, five hits. So the way the White Sox have been doing it all year, they get fairly great mileage out of their hits. Of course, this Sox team, uh, they have never been known as a powerhouse club, and yet here they're utilizing the home run of the very first game. Lawler is the batter against Chen, and the first pitch is a strike one call. Germ had a 3-2 pitch in the center field in the first inning to get the second run off. A fly ball to left. Wally Moon is coming up. The center fielder is coming over. And they run together and they drop the ball. And into second base goes Lawler. Snyder and Moon didn't quite make up their minds. And the ball is finally dropped. Let's see how they're going to roll it. Lawler arrives at second base. Well, the White Sox have breezed out in front, five to nothing. And Billy Goodman is up. Strike one called on Bill. Coming to bat for the second time. First inning. He skied out to the center fielder, Duke Snyder. A ball. You know, the way the wind has been blowing today, there was some doubt as to whether Klesuski's drive would get into the lower seats, but it made it, and what a hit it was for the White Sox. Ground ball, wide of first, I just can't get it, a base hit, here comes the runner around third, and while Lawler is not a speed merchant, he scores. Chicago leads six to nothing. Al has his team. Certainly has looked terrific. Here it is early in the World Series, but they're hitting that ball. That sixth run will be charged against Roger Craig. And left-hander Sandy Colfax is starting to tune up for the West Coast team. The last five batters to come to the plate have all been able to get on. The highlight of this inning, a home run by Theodore Klosiski. Churn, side armor, pitching low and outside to Al Smith. One and all. Right hander cuts loose. Inside a ball. Smith struck out with the leadoff batter in the second. Don't underrate this Al Smith. 
His batting average is not something you write home about, but he can be dangerous. Right hander. Swings and there's a ball well tagged to left. It is over the head of Moon. Ricochets off of the concrete wall. Billy Goodman. They're sending in the third. Wait a minute. They're going to have to the ball gets by Hodges and here comes the man Hall. They had held Goodman up, but the ball got by Hodges and another run scored. Seven nothing Chicago. second base, and they had held it one time, Goodman at third, but then the ball got by Hodges, and Goodman took off for the plate, and he scored, and with it, Smith arrives at third base. The infield is up. The batter now is Jim Rivera, and it's a strike one call. There's a bounding ball to the second baseman. They're coming to the plate. Roseboro lets it get by. They had the man dead coming home, but the ball gets by Roseboro. Another run score. It's now eight to nothing. Chicago. Charlie Neal, with the infield drawn in, made the pickup, and it appeared he made a good throw. But it's skidded by Roseboro, and Smith is allowed to come in, and Rivera takes off and makes second base. are having a big time of it. They rolled an error on Snyder on that two-base hit off the wall by Al Smith. Snyder made the throw, and Snyder was charged with the error. Now, here is still another error added against the Dodgers. The batter is early win. The pitch is a ball. Long. The go-go socks have batted around. Line drive to left center. That might be a hit. It is in there for extra bases. Here comes another run home. Rivera scores. An early win. Chips in with a double. Oh, are these White Sox going to town? They lead nine to nothing. It's a double for early win. On the last play, they ruled an error on Neal. So this has really been a hectic inning for the California Nine. Early win. Doubles home a run. White Sox fans can hardly believe it, but are they having a lot of fun? Seven runs have poured across in this wild third inning. The batter now is Louis Aparicio, batting for the second time. Lewis sends one to the mound. Chuck Churn stops it. He made a look at second base and goes to first, and Louis Aparicio is up. Two gone. Nelly Fox stepping in. It'll be the second time up for him in this inning. Yes, Milwaukee scored seven runs against Bob Turley and knocked him out in the very first inning. The second game of the World Series at Milwaukee last year. There were no errors in that barrage, however. Walks and hits. Now ball one is served up to Nelly Fox. He walked in the first inning and scored. He doubled in the third inning and scored. swing, and he sends one twisting to left foul. Out of play. One and one. The 
Sox have nine runs on eight hits. Early win at second. Fox sends one spinning right out by Cuccinella. Just missed him. One ball, two strikes. Roger Craig started the game. He was lifted midway through this third inning. The towering right-handed Sharon throws as a grass cut it down to short. The pickup is made by Mari Wills over to first in time, and that's the final up. What an inning, though, for Chicago. Seven runs on six hits. There were three Dodger errors and one man left on. And at the end of three innings of play, the score reads, Chicago 9, Los Angeles nothing. Look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp and listen, mister, how are you fixed for a play? Do you have play? How are you fixed for a play? You better check. Please make sure you have enough, cause a worn out play makes you shave and mighty tough. How are you fixed for a play? change for you at third base for the Sox. Sammy Esposito is going in. Billy Goodman coming out. Now we understand that uh, Snyder uh, comes up with a record. Two arrows in one inning in World Series competition. Seven runs were scored. And I do believe three arrows in one inning uh, might hit on a World Series record. But with it all, the White Sox have really stepped out front. Wally Moon will be leading off in the top half of the fourth inning. Now ready to go. Esposito playing at third base. And you'll find that Lopez will be juggling uh, that position quite a bit during the series. All right, a tap ball uh, toward uh, second base. I doubt if they got a play. They do not. Moon beats it out. A drag bunt and a base hit for Wally Moon. Most of you probably remember this if you followed baseball for any length of time, but the most runs scored in any one inning by one club was the Fabulous Athletics in 1929. They scored 10 runs in one inning to beat the Cubs. That was a day that they were trailing 8 to nothing, and the fellow who won the game in that tremendous inning for the A's is attending the game today. A well-known Jimmy Dykes, who is now the skipper of the Detroit Tigers in the American League. Here's Duke Snyder batting against Wynn. One man on, nobody up. Foul ball just below this boot. 0-1. A riotous third inning for Chicago. They lead 9 to nothing. Snyder, the first trip, drew a base on ball. Long fly ball to right field. However, it hangs up, and Rivera is over and just inside the line. That is all for Snyder. One down. Tomorrow, the second game of the World Series will be coming from Chicago. And it'll be on at 1.45 Eastern Daylight Time. Johnny Padres will pitch against Bob Shaw. And if you can't be here, Mel Allen and I will be on the air to bring it your way. Outfielder Norm Locker. They've really had him flying through that outfield, haven't they? As a batter, he lined out to Jimmy Rivera in the first inning. Outside a ball. Most of the time, early win has had to work hard for his victories. A 39-year-older now has a nine-run edge. On the stretch, he throws wide, 2-0. Oh. Oh. 
They have blocked out a few of the seats in the center field bleacher section to give a better background to the batter. Outside high. Three and all. Wynn has given up two hits. Both infield singles. Strike. Three and one. Steady early win. Moves to the plate with a strike two call. Wally Moon located at first. One out. We're in the top half of the fourth inning. Walker sends a high twisting foul down the left field line, and it's getting over uh, near the seats, and ricochets back onto the playing field. Al Smith was digging that time and came very close to getting a hold of it. 3 2. for Smith to return to left. Play resumed. Fly ball, well hit to center. Landis backing off, and the ball hawk surrounds it. Two gone. That's all for Norm Locker. First baseman, Gil Hodges. coming around for the second turn. He let off in the second inning. Skied out to Al Smith and left. Again, the scoreboard reading, nine to nothing. The Chicago White Sox lead in the first game of the World Series. Long drive to left field. Is it coming foul? It is a foul into those lower box seats. Strike one. who haven't seen the White Sox during the season. They have really put on a show today. They're out front. Nine to nothing. They're waiting now for the second pitch to Gil Hodges. Sends one spinning out over second base. It's a hit. And Wally Moon moves on down the line to second. It's all runners at first and second base. Waiting for Johnny Roseboro. The Dodgers, of course, have been behind in games this year. They haven't been behind nine to nothing early in the game very often, I can tell you that, but we have seen them on many occasions come from behind to win. And you'll remember in the middle of September they were trailing and came on to beat off two ball clubs, Milwaukee and San Francisco. Now strike one is called. The official ruling on the play a moment ago. On the ball, it was hit towards second baseman Neal. They ruled an error against Neal on a low throw that got by Johnny Roseboro. Two on, two out. It's a strike. Strike two. Now, Roseboro was in the process of going around a swing. He checked his swing, and plate umpire Summers says 
It's good enough for a strike. Inside. That was that famous early win knuckleball. And he loves to throw it when he gets ahead of the batter. One and two. Now this is the second scoring threat the Dodgers have had. Two out, two on. Swing it. He's out. Win to a fastball outside and Roseboro chased it. So it's no runs, one hit, uh, two hits, and two left on base. Score as we now go into the last half of the fourth inning. Chicago nine, Los Angeles another. You know, fans, this is the first World Series game for everyone on the Chicago team except Early Wynn, Al Smith, Earl Turgeson, and Sherman Lawler. And it's my first chance to be on the Gillette Calvacade of Sports. But believe me, I've been a Gillette man for many, many years. A Gillette razor has always been top for my money, but that new adjustable, man, that is really something. You yourself adjust this razor to suit your skin, your beard. It's so easy. All it takes is a turn of the micrometer dial on the handle of the Gillette adjustable. Now remember, there are nine different numbered settings. The lower numbers give you less blade edge exposure. The higher numbers, more. You get clean, refreshing shaves, fast shaves that make you look and feel like a million. Try the Gillette Adjustable on our guarantee of complete satisfaction or your money back. It costs only $1.95, and that includes a dispenser of Gillette Blue Blades and handsome travel case. to go. And leading off for the White Sox, Jim Landis. Some of the managers that I've talked to in the American League tell me one of these days this fella is likely to be another Willie Mays, the way he flies in the outfield. A ball on inside. In the American League, they'll tell you that nobody can touch him going for a fly ball. And how he's hitting the ball today, Landis. He has two for two and two runs scored. And one run better to cross. Ball one. A strike. The Sox had 11 batters come up in the wild third inning. There's another base hit for that Landis. Oh, is he ever hot. A single to left for Jim Landis. What a way to break into a World Series. And I know those fans and followers of Landis back in California are mighty proud of him. Big boy Ted Klesiski. What an imposing sight he is. He always cuts his shirt sleeve off high up on the shoulder. And exposes those huge biceps. He has a single and a home run to right. Three runs batted across. Rookie Churn goes over to first base. Landis back. Nine to nothing, Chicago leaves. First game of the 1959 World Series. Takes a sweep and fouls this one out of play. One one. The fail hoes now have nine runs and nine hits. Once again, you can hear them cheering for Landis. They want him to steal. How they love to run the Chicago outfit. 
outside. Just the little move that Landis makes while the pitcher is on the stretch is enough to upset you. And, of course, Aparicio is even greater on that move. Right-hander Clem Levine now tuning up in the bullpen. Outside. Two and one. Sox started early with two runs in the first inning. They took advantage of three missed cues in the third and also hit a barrage, six hits, and produced seven runs. Two and one to Clue. There goes the runner. The hit and run is on, and Clue fouls it off. Now, you'll remember those two put a hit run on in the first inning, and it helped lead to two runs. Hodges has called for time. Uh, first baseman moving over to the mound. Three of the six. I should say that three of the nine runs are charged against Churn. Craig was a starter. Keeps an eye on Landis. Fires the ball back to first base. He's safe. Two balls, two strikes. The Los Angeles right hander throws a curve and pull. Let's go another long south order right field. It's a home run. in Chicago on the south side as Ted Klazuski to go one better hits this ball into the upper deck in right field and the White Sox have two more they're running away from the Dodgers now 11 to nothing two home runs for Klazuski in two consecutive times at bat Klazuski has three for three in this game and that might be the curtain for young Chuck Turner Two runs on two hits. You know, the White Sox were never noted for their home run hitting during the season, but they're really showing us home run power today. Offered up by Mr. Ted Theodore Klususki. We're waiting for another pitcher. We pause now. 30 seconds for station identification. WGYWGFM Schenectady. World Series time, party time, or any time. Your thirst demands bright, refreshing satisfaction. Treat yourself to genuine Saratoga Vichy. Enjoy its extra dry flavor and sparkling tang now. Saratoga Vichy. Yellow label. Saratoga Vichy. Yellow label. Saratoga Vichy. Catch dividend days at Troy Savings Bank. Right now, deposits made before October 15th earn a big three and a quarter percent from October 1st. Free parking. Right-hander Clem Levine is making that long, slow walk from the center field bullpen. Well, how about this Ted Klosowski today, fans? He's hit two homers. He has five RBIs. And Chuck Churn is going to leave the game. Nobody out here in the fourth. So Churn pits two-thirds of an inning. Five hits. He gave up. Well, it appears to me today that 
some World Series history is being made. This is truly a, a tremendous ball club, at least through the early rounds of this first game, the White Sox. This is quite surprising in view of the fact that the White Sox have been a team known as a team that beats you with a base hit or a walk, a sacrifice, a stolen base, another base hit, and suddenly they have broken loose with tremendous power so that it has been a complete reversal of form, and that's, of course, uh, if I may be a little bit naive, is what makes it all so wonderful. You really don't know what's going to happen. Uh... Of course, uh, records have been tied right and left. I don't know whether you want to bore the people all of the statistics. Most home runs in a game, uh, the Babe hit three. And, of course, there uh, have been many who have hit uh, two. And, of course, this uh, two in a row here. Uh, but we'll give them the uh, statistics uh, insofar as the records a little bit later. I believe, too, that Mel could tell you that the White Sox were practically last in their own league in home runs. I do believe they hit more home runs against Cleveland, though, than Cleveland hit against Chicago. But be that as it may, Klesiski has really led the parade so far. Now, Clem Levine, the old curveballer, is up there working, and his opponent is now Sherm Luller. Outside, ball one. The third Dodger pitcher has entered the ball game. Clem Levine, right-hander from Woonsocket, Rhode Island, has been considered over the years one of the top relievers in the game. Ball two is low. Now, catcher Lawler hit a sacrifice fly, which was good enough to get a run home in the first. And then he was safe on a two-base para by Duke Snyder in the third inning. Eleven to nothing. Chicago leads. Nobody on. Klosuski took care of that. A fly ball to left. Wally Moon is giving way to Snyder, and Snyder stays with it for the end. It appears to me that Moon and Snyder are having a little difficulty with the wind that's coming off Lake Michigan today. And there are a few wind currents, and the, the tough sun field at this time of day is left field. One down. Two runs across. Esposito is a better high. After the White Sox built up a good lead, Lopez decided to bring in Sammy. E-S-P-O-S-I-T-O. Makes his home right here in Chicago. He's a right-handed better. Ball two, low and outside. Seven year older and a very, very good spot ball player. Strike two and one. Landis with a single, Klazuski with a homer, accounting for two more here in the fourth. Strike two, two. into full motion inside law ball three now Clem usually he's right around the plate over the years he's been known for his great breaking stuff and excellent control Charles Zerota delivers strike three call Levine records a strikeout Two gone. That's all for Sammy Esposito. Outfielder Al Smith. He was out on strikes, but then he turned and got a double to left. He hit one over the head of Wally Moon that ricocheted off of the concrete wall in left. And later scored the eighth Chicago run. Piling up an 11 to nothing lead. That's the story of the White Sox. 
A fly ball hit pretty deep to right center. Snyder and Locker coming together. Who wants it? Locker for the out. So, in the fourth inning, two runs on two hits, including a homer by Klosiski, and nobody left on. And at the end of 4-4, it's the White Sox 11, Los Angeles Dodgers nothing. In Chicago, they're having a merry time, to say the least. For their beloved White Sox are riding high on the crest of the first game right now. 11 to nothing. There will be a second game here tomorrow, and it will be starting at 1.45 tomorrow, Eastern Daylight Time. Johnny Padres has been announced as a pitcher against Bob Shaw. No game on Saturday, and the third game of the World Series from the Coliseum in L.A. on Sunday, starting at 4.45 Eastern Daylight Time. Mari Wills leading off. Right-hander Wynn has been a masterful pitcher out there. He's only allowed three hits. There's a little chop ball down to second base. Fox up over to Kozlowski. And Mari Wills, who can fly, is thrown out. One away. It appears to me that Chuck Asijan is coming out to bat for Levine. Chuck Asijan. Here's another Californian who was in the major league, sent back to the minors. A powerful right-hander. With the Dodgers... In approximately two months of play, he hit 247. A right hander. Batting for Clem Levi. Wind throws. Too high, ball one. Once again, they've got Lefty Koufax warming up in the bullpen. A Asijan goes around and misses. One and one. One out. Top half of the fifth inning. Swinging. Strike two. That's that famous early win. Butterfly pitch, better known as the knuckleball. A season is an outfielder, high, two balls, two strikes. Chuck at one time belonged to the Phillies. Two years ago, he opened the season and picked up two doubles at Cincinnati. We up Robin Roberts to a victory. Later was traded over to L.A. Strike three. He's out. Wins breaking stuff is really terrific. He records another strikeout. His fourth of the game. Two out. Lead off better, Junior Gilliam. Old for two today. Strike. Oh. Out of foul. He went for a change up. Strike two. The White Sox have 11 runs on 10 hits. They're playing errorless ball. The Dodgers, no runs, three hits. And they've committed three miscues. Two out and nobody on. Ball, ball one. Gilliam, a very nervous type hitter. He 
Stanley switches the bat out front. Change up, he pops it up this way. Foul. Chicago picked up two runs in the first inning. They broke loose for seven runs in the third inning. And they added two more in the fourth. Strike three call. Wins getting Hunter as the ball game rolls. Another strikeout, number five. And it's no runs, no hits, and nobody left on. Moving in to the last half of the fifth inning. Chicago, 11, L.A., nothing. Well, here in Chicago today, it's cloudy and cool. Temperature 64. But, hey, wasn't this summer a real scorcher? I'll tell you one thing, though. It sure made me appreciate the refreshing pickup that you get from clean shaving cream cream. Yes, and that reminds me, the Gillette Foamy is one of the top-selling instant lavenders. It's fast and convenient. Just a press of the handy nozzle, and you have rich snow-white lather that holds a barrel of water against your beard. And full-body foamy saves you money, for just a little bit goes a long, long way. Foamy also gives your skin the added protection of K34, an exclusive antiseptic that kills harmful bacteria while you shave. Gillette Foamy comes in two sizes, regular at 79 cents, or the new giant size containing almost twice as much leather for only 98 cents. And if you like, try Foamy with cool, soothing menthol lather. It's available in either size at a store near you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is an extreme pleasure for me to bring to the microphone an old friend of mine of long standing. I consider him tops in our business, and he's worked on many, many a World Series. I put you now in the hands of Mel Allen. Hello there, everybody. Thank you very much, Bye, and what a workout you had in your World Series debut. 11 to nothing in favor of the Chicago White Sox as we come into the last half of the fifth inning. Sandy Koufax, a native of Brooklyn, New York, who now resides in Los Angeles, a six foot two, 204 pounder, who is approaching his 24th birthday, had a record of eight and six on the season. And, of course, turned in a magnificent performance this year when he struck out 18 men in one game to tie Bob Feller's record. Got a good curve. His control is sometimes erratic. And we're all set now as the left-hander comes in to face Jim Rivera, who fouled the first and grounded the second in a fielder's choice play that resulted in an error. The left-hand in with the wind-up. In comes the pitch, and it's a fastball inside. Ball one. A lot of uh, new records have been put into the book today, and some tied. Koufax to the windup delivers. Jim Rivera swings and lets a high fly ball into right field. Norm Larker moving under it. The wind blows it toward the line, and he makes the catch. One away. Early wind will be coming out, and he'll get a round of applause. The 11 men that came to bat in the third inning when they... White Sox scored seven, four short of the record. The A's, when they scored ten runs in the inning, which uh, by told you about. Here's a hand for an early win. When the A's in 1921, uh, 1929 set the World Series record for most runs in an inning, ten against the Cubs, they sent 15 men to the plate. Win the switch hitter. Batting right-handed now against Sandy Koufax. In comes the pitch. Fastball over. Strike one. Win. Hit to the box and double to left. Outfield. Just about straight away. Next pitch swung on and missed. Strike two and win. Really wheeled on that one. He was trying to join Clue. Two facts into the windup. Round comes the left arm to pitch, and it's in there for called strike three. Two away. And some of the White Sox fans still give uh, Wynn a ripple of applause as he returns to the White Sox dugout. 
Little Louis Aparicio from Venezuela popped the short, line to right, and tapped to the box. Right hand hitter. Jim Gilliam shortened up at third. Koufax working fast, delivers. Fastball swung on and missed. Strike one. Wally Moon playing him straight away left. Snyder is shaded a little into left center. Larker. Almost straight away right. Koufax next delivery, an overhand fastball looped over short onto the left center, coming on fast as Moon makes a fine running catch, and that retires the side. No runs, no hits, no errors, no one left on. And at the end of five innings of play, the score, the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. Now, with the miracle of guided medicine, you can relieve your cough as easily as you relieve a headache. Take Thorexin, the guided cough medicine that goes to the right spot, your cough control center. Doctors know coughing is not controlled in the throat. Your throat merely follows orders from the cough control center, which sends the message, and you cough. (coughs) Now, ordinary cough syrups don't even touch the cough center. Until now, only cough medicines with narcotics could depress this cough center. But narcotics may leave undesirable side effects. Instead of narcotics, Thorexin contains demethorphan. Thorexin soothes your throat, then speeds through your bloodstream directly to the cough control center. Thorexin relieves coughing like aspirin relieves headaches. Fast, sure, safe for the whole family. So get Thorexin, the guided cough medicine. In the first half of the sixth inning, Charlie Neal hitting second in the order will be followed by Moon and Snyder. Neal beat out a roller to third in the first inning, grounded to short. Early win, breezing along. Into the windup round comes the right arm, in comes the pitch. Swung on line in the left field for a base hit. Al Smith up for the ball, whips his throw back in to Louis Aparicio. And Charlie Neal comes up with his second base hit of the ball game. Now Wally Moon, who popped to short and beat out an infield hit. Left-hand batter steps in with Duke Snyder to follow. White Sox leading 11 to nothing. Somebody had to lead, but the surprise is the enormity of the score. Wynn checks the runner. Looks over the left shoulder of the pitch. Swung on, little roller, hit down to first to Clue. He takes it, makes the sure out at first base, unassisted, as Neal moves on to second. One away, and here is Duke Snyder, who walked and flied to right. A fellow who has set so many positive records and tied them in World Series play in the past, but who set a new record today when uh, he made two errors in one inning. And that's a record for most errors in an inning by an outfielder. But it would take us a few minutes to tell you about all the positive records the Duke has put into the books. Here's the delivery. Swung on. It's a high pop-up down the left field line. Back of third to win. Holds it. Moving over. Esposito makes the catch right at the edge of the stands with Aparicio sprinting over and standing right behind him. Snyder fouls out to Esposito, who had replaced Goodman. Two down, and here's Norm Larker, who flied to right and flied to center. Left-hand batter. Sixth inning, 11 to nothing White Sox. First game of the World Series. Two men away. Charlie Neal on second base. Wind to the stretch, checks the runner. Here's the pitch. High outside, ball one. Outfield playing straight away. Win ready. In comes the delivery. It's in there for a strike, breaking pitch. Gil Hodges on deck. 
Wynn taking his time now. Neal on second, two away. First half, the sixth inning. Wynn steps off the rubber as Charlie Neal danced way off second base. Neither Aparicio nor Fox were trying to hold him close. Went again to the stretch. Look around. Still eyes on the runner. Now the pitch. And it's high and away. A 2-1 count. Two balls, one strike. Neal leading away from second, unmolested. Wynn delivers. Swung on and missed. Good fastball. Strike two. Two two. Pee Wee Rees coaching at third. Greg Malavia at first. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Neal leading away, and then time is asked for by Norm Marker, and he steps out. Now he moves back into hitting position. Win again to the stretch. Checks the runner. Here's the pitch. Swung on, a ground ball hit foul down the first baseline. Count remains. Two balls and two strikes. Johnny Padres will be pitching for the Dodgers tomorrow. Bob Shaw for the White Sox. And then the series will move on after a day rest or an open date for traveling to the Los Angeles Coliseum. Win again to the stretch. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Here's the pitch. Swung on and missed. A high fastball. Struck him out. No runs, one hit, no errors. One left on, six strikeouts for win. And at the end of five and a half innings, the White Sox, 11. The Dodgers, nothing. A capacity crowd out here today in the neighborhood of 48 to 50,000. And how these Chicago fans have supported their team this year. As a matter of fact, they set an all-time Comiskey Park attendance record. And speaking of records, Chicago along with the rest of the country, has gone all out for the Gillette Adjustable. Now, if you haven't seen this remarkable new razor, then by all means, be sure you do. Never before has there been anything like it. You set an adjusting collar on the handle to match your skin and beard. You can turn to nine different degrees of edge exposure and angle. Within this range, there's a setting that delivers you clean shaves, fast shaves, with comfort that's nothing short of sensational. Gillette guarantees that, or your money back. The Gillette Adjustable costs only $1.95, complete with Gillette Blue Blade Dispenser and Travel Case. For Los Angeles, number two, John Senator, now playing Senator, John Senator. In the last half of the sixth inning, Don Demeter has gone in to replace Duke Snyder in center field. The Duke has been plagued with a knee injury. And so with the White Sox well ahead 11 to nothing, Don Demeter goes in to replace him. In the last of the sixth, Nelson Fox leads off for the White Sox. He walked, doubled, and grounded to short. The pitch swung on, fouled back upstairs onto the roof, strike one. Sandy Koufax. The fourth Dodger pitcher came on last inning and got the side out in one, two, three fashion. Gilliam shortened up at third. Next pitch is into the dirt. One ball, one strike. Fox is a spray hitter. He hits a lot to left and left center. Moon is playing him well over to the left field line. Don Demeter, the replacement for Snyder, shaded in the left center, while Norm Larker is just a little bit off straight away right. Who backs to the wind-up round, comes the left arm, the pitch to Fox, swung on. It's a high pop into very short left. Coming on is Wally Moon, and he makes the catch in behind Maury Wills, who had gone out. 
One down in the sixth. And here is Jim Landis, who has three for three. Single to right, center to right, and to left. Here's the pitch. Swung on. A bouncer hits the short. Wills takes another big hop. Throws on to Hodges. And Landis is out at first. Two up and two down. And here is Kozuski. And listen to the hand. Kozuski with five runs batted in. Single to right in the first inning. And hit consecutive homers in the third and fourth innings. Outfield moves around to the right. Mr. Muscle squares away. Kufax into the windup. In comes the pitch. Swung on. Little bouncer by the mound. The slow roller. Neal up with it. Across the body. Flip in time for the out on a beautiful play by the second baseman, who is magnificent on that throw across the body as he charges in on a slow hit ball. No runs, no hits, no errors. No one left on. And at the end of six innings of play, the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. the Dodgers. Johnny Roseboro on deck and Maury Wills to follow. Hodges flied to left and single to center. He's had one for two. White Sox leading 11 to nothing for the seven run third inning. The outfield plays Hodges to pull. Shaded toward left and center and left. Almost straightaway right. Have a little action now in the Dodger bullpen. Wind checking with Sherman Lawler. Swings to the windup. Round comes the right arm. In comes the pitch. And it's in there for a strike. Johnny Cookstein is warming up for the Dodgers. Walt Austin said before the series began, not making any excuses, but just merely analyzing the situation. The result of the playoffs and the big finish, the pitchers retired. Here's the pitch swung on and fouled back. The most rested man was Roger Craig, who started. But the White Sox quickly got him out of there in the fourth inning. Craig was charged with five runs. Chuck churned with six. Levine and Kupax have come in to stem the White Sox tide. Now the two-strike pitch to the right-hand batter. Gil Hodges takes it into the dirt. It is out in front and skipped by Sherman Lawler. Early win, who's a very amiable fellow. Pleasant smile. When he's out on that mound, is completely different. He's a stony-faced veteran. He stares you down, never gives in to a hitter. One of the greatest competitors in the game. Here's the delivery, and a little tap. Hit to the mound on a check swing. Went up with it, flips to Kozuski, and Hodges is retired. Now coming to bat, Johnny Roseboro, who popped to short and struck out. Early Wynn, who is a native of Hartford, Alabama, and lives in Oklahoma's Florida now. 15th among the all-time winners among Major League pitchers. Delivers the left-hand batter. Fastball in there for a strike. He moves that ball around. In and out, up and down. At 39, a magnificent pitcher still. The pitch swung on and foul back out of play. No balls, two strikes. White Sox 11, Dodgers nothing, seventh inning. A two-strike count, Wynn staying ahead of the hitters. Into the windup, around comes the right arm, the pitch, and it's a little high, one and two. The Dodgers winning the National League pennant this year, coming from seventh, did a magnificent job, and it was a real team effort. 
The one-two pitch on its way. It's high. Ball two. Johnny Roseborough at bat. From Compton, California. Wind to the windup. In comes the 2-2 pitch. Swung on, grounded on the first baseline. One of the field attendants let the ball roll through his legs and some of the fans started reaching for it and rolled by many clutching hands seeking a World Series souvenir. Two balls, two strikes on the left-hand batter. Wind to the windup. In comes the pitch, and Roseboro swings and lifts a high pop-up toward first. Wazuski calling for it. Fox right near him. And in foul territory, two feet foul in behind first base. Roseboro is retired on a pop-up to Ted Wazuski, who himself says it is a wonderful feeling to be in a World Series. Never had been in one with Cincinnati and with Pittsburgh, and suddenly, toward the end of the year, the White Sox acquired his contract from Pittsburgh, and he says, here I am. He says, hard to believe. Marty Wills up, left-hand batter. Takes it high for a ball. Well, he made a believer out of a lot of folks, as well as himself, with that booming bat. The one nothing pitch on its way to Wills. Swings and fouls it back out of play. One and one the count. Clue said, as a matter of fact, that his back feels much better. Doesn't give him much pain. Though he had not hit uh, many homers since joining the White Sox, as by some told you, only two. But he began to get more distance toward the end of the season. Here's the pitch swung on line by a third into left field by Maury Wills for a base hit. Al Smith tosses back into Louis Aparicio. And Will singles to left. For the fifth Dodger hit. And we're going to have a pinch hitter. For Sandy Koufax. Ron Fairley. Ron Fairley, 5'10", 175-pounder, born in Macon, Georgia, lives in Long Beach, California. Stocky left-hand hitter, just 21 years old. From Southern California, the pitch is swung on. He hits a slow bouncer wide at first. Clue goes over, grabs it, flips to win, covering in time. And the side is retired. No runs, one hit, no errors, one left on. And at the end of six and a half innings, the score is the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. Easy as you tuned in this ball game, friends, you can dial just the kind of shave you want with a new Gillette 195 adjustable. That's right. On the handle of this razor is a micrometer dial with markings from one to nine. Yes, there are nine different adjustments of edge, exposure, and angle. A turn to the left gives you less blade edge. Turn the dial to the right, and more blade edge is exposed. Men with light beards, heavy beards, tender skin, any combination in the book are guaranteed clean, long-lasting shaves. Comfort they may never have thought possible. That's a positive money-back guarantee. The Gillette Adjustable Razor, complete with the dispenser of Gillette Blue Blades and Travel Case, costs only $1.95. In the last half of the seventh inning, Johnny Kupstein comes in to pitch. White Sox fans, who of course predominate here today, are up for their seventh inning stretch. They waited 40 years for this World Series. Uh, not all of them, of course, because some of them not 40 years old. But the last pennant the White Sox won was in 1919. They had, of course, won three pennants previously. 
And now Johnny Klipstein comes in to take over. Sandy Kufax, who came on in the fifth, worked two perfect innings, three up and three down in each inning. Sherman Lawler will be leading off for the White Sox in the last of the seventh. Sam Esposito on deck and Al Smith to follow. The White Sox won the first American League pennant in 1901, but there was no World Series. The first World Series was played in 1903. The White Sox won again in 1906 and beat the crosstown rivals, the Chicago Cubs, four out of six. And then in 1917, when the White Sox next won, they beat the Giants four out of six, but lost to Cincinnati in 1919, five out of eight. The Dodgers, on the other hand, have been in nine World Series. This is the tenth. And they've only won one out of the nine which they participated. Right-hander Johnny Klipstein, who had a record of 4 nothing on the season, pitching to Sherman Lawler. The delivery, low outside for a ball. Klipstein only appeared in 28 games, mostly in relief, worked only 46 innings. Here's the pitch swung on and fouled off out of play. A 1-1 count. The brilliant sunshine that prevailed when the first game of the World Series began has now given away to cloudy skies. And the temperature is dropping somewhat below the 64 that it was at noontime. Klipstein delivers to Lawler. Low and away. Ball two, two and one. Lawler hit a sacrifice fly to right center in the first inning. Was safe on an error by Snyder in the third on a fly ball to center, and he flied to center again in the fourth. Here's the pitch. Swung on and fouled off at the plate. White Sox 11. The Dodgers nothing. It's the last of the seven. You know, by it's an oddity if a team ever has to lose a game, they'd rather lose it 11 to nothing, not that this one is over, but they'd rather lose it this way than 3 to 2 or 1 to nothing. I mean, uh, Mel, I think you're absolutely right, and uh, I just looking, I think the highest shutout total, uh, this would tie a record, provided, of course, early keeps going. Lawler swings at the next pitch, grounds it to third. Gilliam is left up with it over to first in time, and there's one away. Now Sam Esposito who took over defensively in the fourth inning for Billy Goodman, a native of Chicago. Al Lopez trying to get a little more punch in his batting order. Starts Goodman. If he gets ahead, he puts Esposito in. The right-hand batter takes low outside for a ball. One ball, no strikes. Esposito appeared in 69 games this year and batted 167. Klipstein's pitch gets the outside corner of the fastball. The count is one and one. One ball, one strike. Outfield shaded a little toward the left. Klipstein working rapidly. Here's the pitch, and it's low outside. Two and one. One away in the last of the, uh, the seventh inning. The 2-1 pitch, swung on, fouled off, back to first out of play up onto the pavilion roof. Got a kick out of seeing uh, Red Faber and Ray Shawk as a battery throwing out the first pitch. Here's the delivery, swung on, hit right back to the box, beautifully grabbed by Klipstein, the throw to first in time. One of those shots that most of the time go right through the middle. Johnny went down with a glove and spirit it, and Esposito is retired. Now Al Smith, who took a third strike, doubled to left, and flied to center. Appeared in the World Series of the Indians in 1954, and they lost four straight to the Giants. Hit 214 in that series. A clutch player. 
Klipstein's delivery over that outside corner for a strike. As the series develops, plays may not develop, but Smithy, Smithy is the kind of a guy may throw the key run out the plate or come up in the late innings and get the key base hit. He swings and loops one down the right field line, and it is in there for a base hit. He had Larker playing over in the right center, and Smith rounds first and goes into second with a double. He sliced it along the right field line and gets himself a double, his second double of the ball game. He's had three extra base hits now in World Series play. He had a homer in 1954. Jim Rivera fouled to first, grounded to second, and flied to right. He's got quite a hitch in his swing. Flips down to the stretch and the pitch. Curveball, line foul down the right field line. Parallel to the right field line into the upper deck. One strike. In the pennant clinching game for the White Sox, Smith and Rivera hit back-to-back homers to break a 2-2 tie and give the White Sox a 4-2 win over Cleveland that clinched the pennant for them. The 37-year-old left-hand batter takes a strike. Fastball in there just above the knees. He's quite a hustling ball player. Doesn't mind climbing walls or diving. Two men out, Smith on second, and two strikes on Jim Rivera. The outfield shaded toward right. Johnny Klipstein ready. In comes the pitch. Fastball swung on and missed. Strike three. He really powdered it by. No runs, one hit, no errors, one left on. And at the end of seven innings, the score is the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. Now, with the miracle of guided medicine, you can relieve your cough as easily as you relieve a headache. Take Thorexin, the guided cough medicine that goes to the right spot, your cough control center. Doctors know coughing is not controlled in the throat. Your throat merely follows orders from the cough control center which sends the message, and you cough. (coughs) Now, ordinary cough syrups don't even touch the cough center. Until now, only cough medicines with narcotics could depress this cough center. But narcotics may leave undesirable side effects. Instead of narcotics, Thorexin contains demethorphan. Thorexin soothes your throat, then speeds through your bloodstream directly to the cough control center. Thorexin relieves coughing like aspirin relieves headaches. Fast, sure, safe for the whole family. So get Thorexin, the guided cough medicine. The seven inning totals, the White Sox, 11 runs, 11 hits, no errors. The Dodgers, no runs, five hits, and three errors. In the eighth inning, it's the top of the Dodger order. Jim Gilliam, Charlie Neal, and Wally Moon. Early win, seeking his first World Series victory, denied that in the 54 World Series when he pitched for the Indians. Set to work to Gilliam, batting left-handed against him. Nothing for three. The pitch is high outside, ball one. Gilliam grounded to short in the first inning, popped out to second in the third, and looked at the third strike in the fifth inning. Esposito shortened up at third. The outfield straight away. Aparicio in a step or two at short. Nelly Fox shading second a little more than first, and in the step from the outfield grass, Lazuski guarding the line. Wind delivers high and away, ball two. You have to shorten up a little bit on Gilliam in the infield. He's good at laying down a bunt. Anything to try and get something started in an inning. The 2-0 pitch. 
swung on, hit foul down the right field line, out of play. The ball landing upon the pavilion roof. The paid attendance today, 48,013. 48,013. Two balls, one strike. Wins delivery. Swung on line between third and short in the left field for a base hit. Al Smith up for the ball, tossing it back into Lou Aparicio. Jim Gilliam holds up after the turn with a single to left. And now Charlie Neal, who's had two for three, an infield hit in the first inning, grounded to short in the third, single to left in the sixth. He has played great ball for the Dodgers. One of the finest fielding second basemen in the game. His timely hitting late in the season helped the Dodgers move into the pennant. Wind of the stretch checks Gilliam. Now the pitch. Outside gets away from Lawler, but not far enough for any advance. Wind throws almost everything in the book, including a, a knuckleball when he gets ahead of you. Changes his speeds on all of his pitches and keeps that ball moving. In, out, up, down, and around. The right-hander checks the runner. Here's the pitch to Neal. Low outside. Ball two. And now we're having some action in the White Sox bullpen. At 39 years of age, early during the season, has sometimes begun to weaken in the late innings. Nellie Fox now trots in from second base to talk to him, and here is Al Lopez coming out of the White Sox dugout to talk to win. Jerry Staley is loosening up for the White Sox, and Jerry Staley's coming in. Apparently, Wynn either tired or may have sustained some uh, type of injury. But you could see as he began to lose his control by, all of a sudden, he, he, his control is beautiful. And he gets a hand now as he leaves. We'll make every effort, of course, to uh, get some information from the White Sox dugout as to the exact reason for Wynn leaving. Ahead, 11 to nothing. Uh, there was no indication, in other words, of his being knocked out, though he'd given up the base hit and fell behind on Charlie Neal. And during the course of the season, Wynn appeared in 37 games, all of them in a starting role, and completed 14. So that uh, that indicates, as we told you before, the freaking retire in the very late innings. Jerry Staley coming in. Staley appeared in 67 games. For the White Sox this year, all in relief. Had the magnificent earned run average of 2.17. And in the clincher against the Indians, the Indians in the last of the ninth loaded the bases with one out. And they brought Staley in to pitch to Vic Power. One pitch. He grounded to Aparicio, who stepped on second and threw to first for the double play that ended the game and brought the first American League pennant to the Chicago White Sox in 40 years. Staley came up with the Cardinals in the National League in later years developed into quite a bullpen expert he moved on to the Yankees uh, and came on to the White Sox on waivers in 1956 he has pretty good knuckleball but his prime pitch in a clutch is a fine sinker that has enabled him to save many decisions for other staff members. 
his most successful season from a one-and-law standpoint was with the Cardinals in 1951. He chalked up 19 victories and 18 in 1953. We've had word from the White Sox dugout that early wins right elbow began to stiffen up. And so Al Lopez, rather than risk, of course, any serious injury, and with this uh, big lead, removes him in favor of Jerry Staley. Early win then went seven innings, plus nobody out in the eighth, allowing six hits. Walked one and struck out six. A two-nothing count now on Charlie Neal. Gilliam leading away from first. Staley, a right-hander, delivers. It's in there for a strike. The next pitch, swung on and grounded foul down the third baseline, 2-2. Should Neal walk, the walk would be charged to win with a count of two and nothing or two and one or three and one or three and nothing. That situation exists. Here's the pitch swung on, ground ball hit to Aparicio over to Fox for one, back to first. It's a double play. Boy, it was a close one at first base. Frank Bascoli of the National League up for the right hand. And that's been typical of Staley. Coming in with men on and throwing that sinker and getting the double play. Although Neal with his speed almost beat it. It was a very close play at first. Here's Wally Moon. Popped to short. Had an infield hit and grounded to first. Left hand batter takes a strike. Nothing in one. 11 to nothing White Sox. First half of the eighth. The delivery to Moon. Swung on, bounced to the box. An underhand toss to Clue, and Moon is retired. No runs, one hit, no errors, no one left on. And so the score, at the end of seven and a half innings, remains the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. Here we go with a few more words about that new Gillette 195 adjustable razor. This is a shaving instrument you surely ought to know about. On the handle of the Gillette Adjustable, there's a dial with numbers from 1 to 9. Each setting provides a different degree of edge exposure and angle. At the lower numbers, there's less blade edge. As you turn towards the higher numbers, more and more blade is exposed. Between 1 and 9, there's a stop that guarantees utmost shaving luxury. Clean shaves with the comfort every man wants. And it's sold on our money-back guarantee. We guarantee the finest shaves you've ever had. Refreshing shaves that keep you looking your best hour after hour. You'll find the new Gillette Adjustable in trim travel case with a dispenser of Gillette Blue Blades at a nearby store. Only In the last half of the eighth inning, Jerry Staley will be the first batter, followed by Louis Aparicio and Nellie Fox. The five runs batted in by Ted Klazuski ties a World Series record. Most runs batted in the game. Tony Lazari for the Yankees in uh, 1936 and Bill Dickey for the Yankees in 1936. Jerry Staley at bat. Johnny Klipstein's pitch. Misses outside. Ball one. Al Lopez, ever ready. Despite the score of a ball game, has a couple men loosening up. Here's the pitch, and it's in there for a strike. One and one. Tomorrow, Johnny Padres, who won the big game for the Dodgers against the Yankees when they won 
the World Series a few years back will go against Bob Shaw. Now the pitch. It's in there. One and two. Jerry Staley at bat from Vancouver, Washington. Billy Pierce is just loosening up and Barry Latman along with him. The one-two pitch to Staley swung on and fouled back out of play. It is uh, speculation on our part, but we think Pierce is simply loosening up for a future start. There was some thought that he might pitch here tomorrow and not in the Coliseum because of the left field, uh, the shortness of the left field fence there. Next pitch is a curveball over for call strike three. But on the other hand, Al Lopez figured he better go with a young man in case the series goes six, seven games, who might come back. Because in a short series, you got to go with those fellows who can come back with short rest. And Pierce has been having some arm trouble this year, though on any given day, he's one of the best in the business. Louis Aparicio, nothing for four, right-hand hitter. Pipstein's pitch is over the outside corner for a called strike. Louis popped to short, line to right, hit to the box, and fly to left. Gilliam shortened up at third to protect against the bunning uh, ability of this man. Aparicio swings, sends a slow roller out to second. Charlie Neal up with it, flips on to Hodges, and Aparicio is retired. Andy High, in his scouting report, said the one fellow you have to keep off base to beat the White Sox is Aparicio. Well, they've kept him off base today, but... The White Sox has just turned uh, the form sheet upside down with a power explosion. Here is Nelson Fox, who walked double, grounded to short, popped to short, swings and grounds one to second. Neal scoops it up, flips on to Hodges, and that retires the side. No runs, no hits, no errors, no one left on. At the end of the eighth inning, the score is White Sox 11, Dodgers nothing. seconds for station identification. This is WGY, WGFM Connect Day. So you don't miss the next action-filled game of the 1959 World Series. Follow your team. Follow a, every thrilling play on your World Series station, WGY 810 on your radio dial. Tomorrow's game from Chicago gets underway at 1.45 p.m. on NBC and WGY, your exclusive World Series station. First half of the ninth inning, the White Sox 11, the Dodgers nothing. Back in 1934, Dizzy Dean shut out the Detroit Tigers in the World Series 11 to nothing. And so far, this ties then the World Series record for the largest shutout in series play. Jerry Staley pitching to Don Demeter, right-hand batter, takes it inside. Demeter had replaced Snyder last inning. Demeter, tall, right-hand hitter. Batted 256 on the season. Jerry Staley's pitch is a breaking pitch outside. The count, two balls, no strikes. Demeter from Oklahoma City, 6'4", 180-pounder, 24 years old. The pitch swung on and missed. Threw him a knuckleball in tight. Two and one. (laughs) 
the 2-1 delivery. Gets the outside corner breaking pitch. Two balls, two strikes. Norm Larker on deck and Gil Hodges to follow. First of the ninth, first game of the World Series. The veteran Jerry Staley delivers. Swung on and missed. Strike three. One down in the ninth. The seventh Dodger to go down on strikes. Win before he retired, had struck out six. Norm Larker flied to right, flied to center, and struck out. Left-hand hitter. The pitch is in there. Strike one. Norm Larker, native of Beaver Meadows, Pennsylvania, now resides in Mobile, Alabama. Jerry Staley comes in now with pitch that's outside. Ball one, one and one. A seven-run explosion in the third inning for your late tuners in. Put it away for the White Sox. With Big Ted Kuzuski getting two consecutive homers in this game. Staley's delivery. Swung on, line foul down the right field line, out of play. In fact, for those of you who are just on your way home, or might have just gotten home, or just had a chance to tune in, the White Sox got two in the first, seven in the third, and two in the fourth. The one-two pitch. Swung on, looped over short in the left center, and it's in there for a base hit. Landis goes over, cuts it off nicely, whips the throw back into Aparicio, and Larker's held to a single. Landis is capable of showing you some exciting defensive play in center because of his great speed. That's one of the reasons. Cover a lot of ground out there. And that makes a difference, of course, with teams that win a lot of one-run ball games and you can hold a man to a single instead of a double or a double instead of a triple. The White Sox won 35 out of 50 one-run games this year. And the Dodgers were very much the same kind of a team, winning 33 out of 55 one-run games. Gil Hodges fouls the pitch off to the left of the plate, strike one. Gil flied to left, single to center, and hit to the box. Here is one of the nicest men it has ever been our pleasure to meet in baseball. Daly delivers to Gill. Hodges swings and grounds it by off the glove of Esposito. He can't make a play. It's a base hit. Moving on to second is Norm Larker. Esposito made a fine play even getting the glove on it. The ball spun away from him. Aparicio going the other way was too far by him to even take the deflection. And Hodges is credited with a base hit. Runners on first and second. One out. And here's Johnny Roseboro. Popped the short, struck out, and fouled out to first. One out in the ninth, two on. Jerry Staley delivers. Swung on and missed. Strike one. Outfield straight away. Staley's next pitch outside, ball one, one and one. If you go by precedent, you can dismiss this first game, assuming that the Dodgers are defeated. The one-one delivery swung on and fouled off to the right of the plate. The St. Louis Cardinals won a playoff for the National League Pundit in 1946 and went on to win the World Series. The Giants did the same in 1954. The Indians did the same in 1948. The one-two pitch. Swung on. There's a ground ball grabbed by Klazuski. Throws down to Aparicio to force Hodges. And Big Clue took a base hit away from Johnny Roseboro. As he broke to his right, 
being a left-handed thrower, reached out with the right hand, the gloved hand, and speared the ball when it appeared as if it would be a base hit to right. He threw on the Aparicio to force Hodges, Larka moving on to third. And Carl Ferrillo, a hero of many a Dodger win in regular season and World Series play, is coming up to hit for Maury Wills. Carl Ferrillo, appearing in his 37th World Series game. Two men out in the ninth, 11 to nothing, in favor of the White Sox. The pitch swung on, say, high pop foul off third and out of play. Brillo hit 290 on the season, appeared in only 50 games. A native of Stony Creek Mills, Pennsylvania, and now resides in Manhattan Beach, California. He's had 33 World Series hits. Swings and grounds it foul down the third baseline. Two strikes. Lark on third. Roseboro on first. Two outs in the ninth. 11 to nothing. Chicago. Staley's pitch to Perillo swung on and grounded foul down the first baseline. Stan Williams is loosening up for the Dodgers. The second game of the World Series at Comiskey Park tomorrow. An open date Saturday and the series resumes in Los Angeles on Sunday. Larker leads off third, Roseboro off first, and the pitch to Perillo is inside, one and two. Outfield toward left and center and left, straightaway right. Runners leading away now from first and third. Jerry Staley in relief of wind delivers, and it's inside, ball two, two, two. Two balls, two strikes, two outs, two on. First of the ninth. Staley to the stretch. Runners lead away from first and third. The pitch to Perillo. Swung on. It's a high fly ball out into left field. Al Smith moving under it. Makes the catch and the first game of the World Series is history. And the White Sox win it 11 to nothing. No runs, two hits, no errors, and two men left on with Jerry Staley coming on to finish up for early win, relieving him in the eighth inning when early win's right elbow stiffened up. And while we have learned to expect anything any day in any sports event, we were surprised today with a sudden power unleashed by the White Sox. And the final score, Chicago, 11 runs, 11 hits, no errors, the Dodgers, no runs, eight hits, and three errors. In just a moment, we'll review the highlights of today's game for you. The White Sox get off to a running start with 11 runs, 11 hits, no errors, and three left on. The losing Dodgers, no runs, eight hits. They committed three errors, all of them in one inning, eight left on. Early win goes seven innings to become the winner. And while this is a shutout, it does not go as an individual shutout to win, for he needed help, and Staley came on. I understand the stiffening of the right shoulder and elbow was only a precautionary thing, and Lopez didn't want to take any chances with the wind blowing off Lake Michigan. So early win is the winner. It's the first time he's ever won a World Series game. He lost one, you'll remember, to the Giants in the 1954 Classic. Roger Craig is the defeated pitcher today. He formerly had a victory and a loss in World Series competition against the Yankees. He was driven out in the third inning. The White Sox, you could see, were off and running in the very first inning. A walk to Fox, a single, and a single on a hit and run with Kluzewski, and a sacrifice fly by Schermlotter gave them two. But they exploded in the third inning to score seven times. And in that inning, the Dodgers threw in three arrows to help things along. Uh, Duke Snyder, uh, an honor I know he doesn't cherish, 
but at least he broke a record for making two arrows in one inning for an outfielder. Ted Klozuski tied a record, and I know he's mighty proud of, considering this is the first World Series game he's ever played in. Klozuski had a single and two home runs and drove in five of the 11 runs. And as Mel had told you earlier, the 11 to nothing shutout ties the all-time shutout high, which Dizzy Dean hung on the Detroit Tigers in 1934, on October 9th of that classic between the Cardinals and the Detroit uh, Tigers. The White Sox fans, well, they can hardly believe it. But, of course, in a short series, you never know how long a World Series is going to go. It might go four. It might go seven. But the White Sox are off and running. And, of course, they haven't had a World Championship here in Chicago since way back in 1917. The game was played in two hours and 35 minutes. Craig, the loser, behind him, we had Chuck Churn, Levine, Koufax, and Klipstein. Klasuski was a big item. There was no question about it. His home run in the third inning was into the lower seats in right field. His next home run was a titanic shot that carried into the upper deck. So that's the story. And the final score from Chicago today, 11 to nothing with the White Sox winning.